My name is Campbell. I am 15 years old. I love to paint pictures. I like to hang out with friends and family. My favorite place to be is in my cottage that make a wish built for me. I live in Richmond, Kentucky. The following audio features Michelle Park, Campbell Doty's mother. Campbell is nonverbal due to her disability and sometimes uses a dictation device to speak in person. Campbell felt most comfortable having Michelle participate in the interview to answer our questions. So Campbell was actually born with a bilateral cleft lip and palate. And at that time, the doctors really felt like it was probably an isolated case because everything else looked great. But as she started to develop, we noticed that she wasn't hitting milestones. So for several years, we took her to many different specialists and never really could find any specific diagnosis. So she kind of fell in this undiagnosed category, which actually many people fall into. (laughs) But when Campbell was 11 years old, um, through genetic testing, they found that she had a rare syndrome called boring opit syndrome. And it's actually kind of an ultra rare syndrome because at that time, when she was diagnosed, there was only, uh, it was under 100 people in the whole entire world. And a lot of that was because, so Campbell was born in 2006 and the, the genome was not even discovered for that disorder until, th- until I believe it was 2011. So, and I may have those dates a little off, but it, was, it wasn't even found until after she was born. So that's why the initial genetic testing didn't show it. That disorder, there's not a whole lot known about it. But some children are very similar to Campbell where there is limited mobility, she's nonverbal, she has cortical vision impairment, and really the main thing that she has had a challenge with is seizures, seizure disorders. So she fortunately is on medication that keeps those fairly well under control. She will have breakthrough seizures. But in uh, 2012, when she was six, she had a major seizure that caused her to go into cardiac arrest. And she also, at that time, suffered hypoxia. And so some of her challenges that she faced are due to the hypoxia as well. So um, she has kind of a little bit of of both different um, conditions. I think a lot of parents... And I'm sure Campbell herself, you know, felt like, what can we do to make this better? How can we cure it? And you do kind of want to find that community that with, whether it's with parents, medical for professionals. So we didn't have that. So being in that undiagnosed community for so long, I think we had finally gotten to a point where we were just like, let's treat the symptoms kind of, or make the, you know, best of what Campbell was facing. So we really focused on that. We focused on living life, giving her wonderful experiences and not focus on a diagnosis. But we were very fortunate to go to Cincinnati Children's Hospital where in their genetic department, they actually had the expert on boring opit syndrome. So when she came back around that time, they said, you know, we do have this new genetic testing. Let's just give it a shot. And the funny thing was, so in the world of genetics, it is just very (laughs) complicated, but her original, it's just so much. Yeah. Her original geneticist took her case to, it was either boring or it was one of the two doctors. Cause of course the syndrome's named after boring opus. And he said to him, he said, I have this child and I kind of think she fits the criteria, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. And so he took her case to him and he said, you know, she fits all these certain things, but I just, I, I just don't think so. But then when she was tested, lo and behold, it was that. So I just, I thought that was kind of an interesting thing because, you know, still it's just so hard to really pinpoint, but I'll never forget when um, I received, we received that diagnosis, there was almost just this sense of relief 
that there was an explanation. Um, even though there's so much still unknown, we were able to connect with a lot of other families. Because, you know, if you're given a diagnosis, say, of like Down syndrome, autism, you have this huge database and this huge roadmap that you can kind of follow and be like, okay, well, when Campbell reaches this age, I can expect this. Or when this happens, I can expect this. And we had none of that. So now we are kind of creating that for other families, even though we're still uncertain, <laughs> we're kind of creating that. So in a way, that's kind of empowering in a sense, and very much helpful to kind of have that where I go to that. That's the thing Campbell is kind of teaching the doctors because oftentimes I may call the doctor about a specific issue she has and they'll say, well, we really, you know, we don't know why that's occurring. And I'll say, well, I talked to two or three other parents who their child's doing the same. So, you know, it's kind of that whole, that teaching process. Another limitation that we do face is just accessibility out in the world. I was thinking of this earlier and it's like, you know, when I tell people that they're like, oh, but we have ADA, everything's supposed to be accessible, but you quickly find out, <laughs> especially, you know, Campbell's in a wheelchair. So, you know, there's a lot of places we go where she cannot get into the, the facility. The biggest challenge too is accessible bathrooms. You know, a lot of people don't think about that. Having the ability to have an adequate changing area for her. But for the most part, you know, she loves to paint. We do, uh, you know, it's she and I are here you know, at our home. She loves to paint. We have a beautiful cottage that Make-A-Wish built for her. So she gets out there, she listens to music. So she's really happy, which I'm very thankful for. She also still is a teenager and has, has her, you know, attitudes and and all that good stuff. But, but yeah, I'd say accessibility is probably the biggest obstacle. So um, Campbell, she loves to go shopping. My mother lives in town and one of my sisters. And so she does. She loves to go shopping. She's, you know, again, typical 15 year old girl, loves music. And I know I mentioned it earlier, but she loves painting. And we're actually getting ready to start just like a little kind of business for her where she's going to sell some of her painting. We had one that was just recently auctioned off for Make-A-Wish. And it was actually the highest item in the whole auction was Campbell's painting. It's just so fun. And she does. She's so proud of it, aren't you, sweet girl? <laughs> and then she also, in the past couple of years, we've had some families that their daughters have become good friends with Campbell. And so she enjoys spending time with them. Of course, with the pandemic, we've kind of been limited to that. But we're hoping, you know, soon to potentially resume some of that. She has a very full life. She and family is very important. She spends a lot of time with her grandparents and her brother and her dad. Um, and of course me. Um, so yeah, she, she has a good community. I have a background in occupational therapy. And so I tell everybody, that I think I was trained in occupational therapy in order to be her mom, because that's my mindset. Like my mindset is first and foremost, okay, well, how can we make this work? Like, yeah, she might have a visual disability or, or issue, but what do we need to do to make it where she can see things better? Or how do we position something? You know, life can be very unpredictable and that you do just kind of have to go with the flow and try to, you know, I always, and I think Campbell too, have tried to look at it like positive, like, you know, you try to make the best of things, but in reality, it is sometimes a struggle. It's not all, you know, roses. So I think you also have to stop and, you know, kind of make, have a balance between that and recognize that, you know, there are days where, you know, we may have to rest or cancel plans and, I think the biggest thing is having that community of people that are understanding, because I think sometimes we will meet people who maybe 
don't understand kind of the whole disability world, sometimes people would stare at her or, or kids. And I find we finally got to the point where it was like understanding that it's more that people just don't understand and they may not know how to approach you. So then we kind of took the, the road of like if we see a child who's staring at Campbell's wheelchair, I might go over and say, hey, you want to you want to touch this or, you know, and just nurturing those human connections and really trying to educate people like, hey, we really aren't different. My favorite thing, and honestly, I can tell you it's Campbell's too, is when you do have a child and they're usually young and she has some cousins who will just take her and just go. You know, like they'll take her and they'll, they'll do her makeup and they just, there's no hesitation. Um, It's just Campbell's one of the girls. Um, They had a slumber party and we've been very fortunate. Like I think I mentioned over the past couple of years to connect with some families that have girls around Campbell's age. And one in particular, just really enjoyed Campbell, her brother and dad mow our yard. And so she wanted to invite Campbell to a birthday party a couple of years ago. And Campbell went, it was a pool party, all these girls and talk about being inaccessible. Okay. Which of course, I mean, it was above ground pool with all these steps. It didn't matter. They just, the guys just picked her up, her wheelchair up the steps, took her up to the, to the deck. They had a canopy and a fan. I mean, none of this, they hadn't asked me anything. They just, they knew Campbell. They listened. It was just like, we just invited Campbell to our party. And like I said, the canopy, she doesn't do real well in direct sunlight because of her cortical vision impairment. They knew that. So they had that to protect her from the sun. They had the fan going because they knew she has trouble regulating her body temperature. So it's just, it's just, that's what's awesome. And, and again, all those girls, There was probably 10, 15 girls there had never met Campbell. Didn't matter. They just uh, included her like anybody else. So that's the thing is like, if you give children the chance, they will, they'll accept, accept people. I think the, the best advice that I can give is just to very much include the person and the family in the care. And we have been very lucky to do that. When I worked as an occupational therapist, we really tried in our facility, tried to, you know, make the patient and the family a part of the team. I think that's more common, or at least in my experience than not, but you still run across some medical professionals that, you know, just want to kind of dictate like, this is what we're doing. This is, you know, I'm in control and all that stuff. But I think, you know, again, just to listen to the patient and the family, because everybody's experience is different, realize that there are a lot of things going on, you know, kind of that whole mind, body, soul thing, you know, there's the emotional aspect of having a disability. And so kind of, I think sometimes, you know, if you're a, medical professional that may focus on just say a physical thing, you know, realize that there may be some, you know, emotional or mental health issues. And that kind of probably goes back to the whole occupational therapy, (laughs) treating the whole person, not just that one thing. So we've always tried to be involved in this, you know, anything that anytime we can share our story, because I think sharing your story is very helpful to other people because that, especially in the undiagnosed community, anytime you can just hear another person that is maybe even going through something just a little bit similar, you feel like, oh my goodness, I'm not alone. Recently, we have been very involved with Make-A-Wish since they did build, um, and not just because of that, but, you know, she was involved in that. We were able to see how much that has helped her. Now we are trying to raise money and awareness because there's so many kids out there that are waiting on wishes. And then of course, the big thing with the Boring Opitz Syndrome Foundation, there's also another, a couple of other Boring Opitz groups and the registry, um, being involved and that's just more or less um uh help collecting the data like things that she deals with 
so that they can kind of have that database and that registry when someone is diagnosed with BOS, then the doctors and medical professionals can pull from that and just share, you know, sharing information um, amongst the different parents and just connecting and seeing like troubleshooting, like, you know, my daughter started doing this, has your child done, you know, so that's been our focus. Don't be afraid to ask or to, you know, see how you, what you can do to assist people with disabilities to become more inclusive. I I can't tell you how many times we just have random people just talk to us and, Hey, how are you doing? I mean, again, you don't know how much that um, just normal interaction can really boost your day. I mean, Campbell, loves it she just lights up like there's no no hesitation knowing that 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 makes her really happy so I think that's the biggest thing is just you know don't be afraid to ask or to um, become you know involved in the disability community.